So, ma'am, shall we start the permission? So, Dr. Madhav, ma'am. Your mic is mute, ma'am. I'll make it. Uh, yes. Yes. Hello. So, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I can hear, ma'am. Uh, can we start, ma'am? Sure, sure. Why? Yeah, we can. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good evening, doctors. This is Dr. Someshwar from Shield Healthcare. I welcome you all on behalf of Shield. Thank you very much for joining today's webinar. I request all the participants to post their questions in the comment box so that at the end of the webinar, we'll have a short Q&A session. So let me welcome today's our uh, eminent speaker. Actually, she doesn't need any introduction. She has come for a lot of webinars and educational activities. She is Dr. M. Madhavi, ma'am. Uh, she has done her medicine uh, DGO, FMS, FRM, and she's a senior consultant, gynecologist, obstetrician, and laparoscopic surgeon practicing in West Maripalli, Sikindrabad. She has about 22 years of practice and consulting experience. She has done her uh, medicine and DGO from Jawaharlal Nehru Government Medical College, uh, Raipur, and she's a consultant at Gita Multi Specialty Hospital at the West Maripalli, and it is an NABH uh, accredited hospital. She's also consultant at Basant uh, Sahane Hospital and consultant at Ishida Hospital. Her field of interest is high-risk pregnancies, vaginal surgeries, infertility, and laparoscopic surgery. She has done her fellowship in laparoscopy from World Laparoscopy Hospital, New Delhi, Akhredatova. She has a strong desire to learn and consistently update her knowledge in all fields of obstetrics and gynecology. She has given many guest lectures on adults and girls, uh, ops emergency, cervical cancer uh, vaccine, and is on the experts panel for the cervical cancer vaccine. She regu uh, regularly conducts camps for anemia, thyroid screening, BMI, osteoporosis, and screening for breast tumors. She has conducted many virtual CMEs during the pandemic on GDM, emergency contraception, nutrition and pregnancy, and among us others. She regularly attends CME programs, workshops, and conferences in India and as well as abroad to keep abreast of the latest development. She is also on the subcommittee for health for all the in, uh, all India industrial exhibition and also member of governing body of Ellen Gupta Memorial Health Center, Hyderabad. She is a life member of Foxy, IMA, and IHEA. So with this, we welcome you ma'am for today's webinar. Uh, as we know that uh, uh, half of the all the pregnancies are not planned. Unplanned pregnancies are at greater risk of preterm birth and low birth weight babies. Another reason is that despite important uh, advances in the medicine and prenatal care, about one in eight babies are born too early. So the researchers are trying to find out the reasons and how to prevent the preterm birth, but the experts agree that women need to be healthier before becoming a pregnant. So by taking care of uh, health issues and risk before pregnancy, we can prevent these problems that might affect you or your baby later. So now, without much affecting, uh, wasting the time, let me turn over the time to Dr. Malavi Ma'am to talk on preconception health. Over to you, ma'am. Namaskar. Welcome to this yet another session on uh, preconception health. At the outset, I thank the organizers for having given me this opportunity to talk on such a such an important topic, preconception health. Yes, we all want healthy mother and healthy babies, for which we really need to emphasize on the preconception health. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, hope all are safe haven't taken the uh, second dose of the vaccine and uh, been able to sail through the uh, second lockdown. And now we are in a period of unlock. Definitely, I look into uh, all my colleagues, friends, seniors are uh, taking up and taking care of. We prevail, the Foxians prevail, continuing to take care of the mothers and have a healthy baby. So uh, 
I uh, I will get into this uh, talk on uh, preconception health. Jod but not sure said, take care to be born well. Now, why is it so important? Status of preterm and low birth weight demographic risk factors and health systems re responsiveness in USAID's 24th MCH pri priority countries. So where are the most preterm births? And you'll be shocked to see India stands uh, in the topmost um, uh, top seat that is almost about uh, 35 lakh, 20,000 uh, preterm births happen and more important impaired preterm survivors per year. That is a very, very shocking figure of almost 80,000. Now, when we see even uh, Pakistan stands second equally, but here the difference of uh, uh, impaired survivors are much, much less. So we need to just reduce this figure and uh, work on it. Now, reproductive and child health, four out of 10 women report that their pregnancies are unplanned. Perinatal deaths are 50% higher among babies born to adolescent mothers. Up to 80% of the pregnancies among women with untreated gonococcal infection in the prenatal death. Maternal undernutrition and iron deficiency anemia accounts for almost 20%. Female genital mutil mutilation increases, increases with the, the risk of neonatal deaths by 15 to 55%. And in the absence of interventions, rates of HIV transmission from mother to the child Eliminating smoking before or during pregnancy could avoid preterm related deaths and 22 to 23% of the cases of sudden infant death syndrome. Incidence of adverse pregnancy outcomes. Now, spontaneous abortion, we just see as 20% estimated average infant mortality, six per 1000 life births, fetal mortality, 6.2 per 1000 life births plus Fetal deaths, major defects, 3.3%, low birth weight, 8%. Now here you see the figure of preterm delivery almost going up to 11.4%. That's a double digit. Complications of pregnancy, 30.7%. Unintended pregnancies, 45%. In unintended births are 31%. So this is what the data says. Now, future aspects, we can achieve Millennium Development Goal for uh, reduce mortality and Goal 5, improve on the maternal health. As per the Sustainable Development Goal 3 by 2030, we can reduce global MMR to less than 70 per one life birth, neonatal mortality to 12 per thousand life births and under five mortality to 25 per uh, life births. Now, during our time, what was the point, a thing always taught to us, when a woman is planning for pregnancy, yes, you start two months of uh, uh, prior to conception, put her on folic acid. That was the dictum what was given to us that to have a healthy baby, let her be on uh, two months prior to conceiving on folic acid. Now, history of maternal mortality rate, maternal mortality rate in India that was initially, now here we conceive in uh, 2010, that was one fourth of the MMR. Now, number of what is MMR is the number of maternal deaths per lakh live births. Now, this in 2014, it has reduced to one fifth of, one fifth in 2014. So we are almost contributing uh, one fifth to the global absolute maternal deaths. Now we can see what was the uh, MMR in 1990. That's a shocking figure, 556. Now in 2000, 
10 to 12, it reduced to 178, 167, 130, and now it is 122. Now, priority interventions for mothers and newborns and children, when do we intervene? So when is the uh, time when we intervene to give uh, birth to a healthy child? So what it says is preconception. Here is uh, the neonatal, infancy, preschool, school age, and adolescence. So this is the part becomes the reproductive years. Now, preconception and pregnancy, that is the adulthood. That is the time during adolescence and before pregnancy. Pregnancy, birth, postpartum, newborn, maternal health, infancy, and childhood. So what is preconception care? This is the provision of biomedical, behavioral, and social interventions to women and couples before conception occurs. It aims at improving their health status and reducing behaviors, individual environmental factors that contribute to the poor maternal and child health outcome. Its ultimate aim is to improve the maternal and child health in both short and long term. So, not a new concept. The physical treatment of child should begin as far as may be practicable with the earliest form of the embryo. It will therefore necessarily involve the conduct of mother even before her marriage as well as during pregnancy. Now, why preconception care? Adverse pregnancy outcomes remain a prevalent health problem. 12% of the babies are born premature, 8% with low birth weight, 3% have major defects, 31% of women giving birth suffer pregnancy complications. Now, the risk factors for adverse pregnancy outcomes remain prevalent among women of reproductive age group, smoking, obesity, teratogenic drugs, pre-existing medical conditions like diabetes. Now, early agency is too late. That's, that's really a very, very sh uh, shocking statement from the decades which we had that Supplements. So supplementing two months of folic acid does not, uh, uh, you know, take us to the uh, uh, can, uh, to the result of having a healthy mother and a healthy baby. So what it says is early ANC is too late to prevent some birth defects. The heart begins to beat at 22 days after conception. The neural tube closes by 28 days after conception. The palate fuses at 56 days after conception. Now, the critical period of teratogenesis is 17 to 56 days to prevent implantation errors. Now, the critical period of development, let us see around, this is the most, most susceptible time for major malformation. Fourth week, fifth week is the central nervous system that goes on to sixth week heart and six weeks further arms, eyes, legs, palate, external genitalia, ear. Now, once they are into the missed period, usually it doesn't happen unless the woman is conscious enough to approach us just after the missed period. They usually, the mean entry after you know, the data says the mean entry into the prenatal care is way late. That is around 11 weeks. It is far, far late where we are aiming before getting pregnant, then expecting them at least at the time of the pregnancy when they have missed the period, they need to come and see us. So the mean entry is somewhere around 11 weeks. Now, the need for preconception care is currently Poor pregnancy outcomes, women enter pregnancy at risk for adverse outcomes only when they have had previous any adverse outcomes like IUD, spontaneous uh, abortion, only then they reach you. So we intervene too late. Now, there is consensus that we must act before pregnancy. Intervening before pregnancy will help us improve the outcomes. Now, the Benefits of preconception care, let us see. How does this preconception care? It helps in reducing unintended 
help pregnancy, prevent birth defects, prevent low birth weights and prematurity, prevent poor pregnancy outcomes and recurrence, promote healthy behaviors and reduce risk-taking behaviors, prepares and reinforces parents for parenting, promote family planning. Now, preconception care has a positive effect on the range of health outcomes like maternal mortality, unintended pregnancies, complications during pregnancy and delivery, diarrhea, vertical transmission of HIV, STD, risk of type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, breastfeeding. Now, neonatal outcomes, neonatal mortality, abortion, stillbirths, preterm births, low birth weight, and uh, uh, stunting growth, birth defects, neonatal infections, childhood cancers. So this, these all, uh, uh, I mean to say, uh, these things can be reserved, uh, reduced if the woman has already had a preconception health. Now, early prenatal care is not enough. In many cases, it is too late. So where do we stand now? Time for a paradigm shift is from healthy mothers. Healthy mothers, the woman is already pregnant. So it is not at the time of pregnancy that we need to understand. So it is not the healthy mothers giving birth to healthy babies, but we need to have a healthy woman first and then get a healthy mother and healthy babies. Now the risk factors that contribute to maternal and childhood mortality and morbidity the prevalent risk factors among women when they get pregnant, according to CDC, some risk factors prevalent are pre-existing medical conditions contribute 4.1%, rubella seronegative 7.1%, smoking, alcohol, inadequate prenatal care, almost contributing to 15.9%, like the medical conditions, cardiac disease 3%, hypertension 3%, asthma 6% and diabetes up to 9%. Overweight or uh, obese 50% not taking folic acid 69%. Dental caries, oral disease contributing more than 80%. So these are the risk factors, you know, when the woman gets pregnant, but they are not aware about the uh, additional medical condition, dental conditions. So we need to uh, what care is required on the general issues in preconception care. Environmental exposures like assist for the workplace exposures to toxicants, industries that are known to use toxic chemicals and laboratory healthcare, dry cleaning, printing, manufacturing, and agriculture. Assist for household exposures to potentially harmful agents such as Healthy met heavy metals, solvents, and counsel patients about avoiding mercury exposures. So these are environmental exposures, family genetic history, like family history for congenital anomalies or genetic disorders, refer couples for genetic counseling, medications like uh, they might be on tetragenic medications. So switch over to safer medications when possible and use fewer dosages needed to control the disease. Psychiatric illness, screen for depression, anxiety disorders, counsel patients about the risk of untreated depression during pregnancy. Now the psychosocial factors, screen for intimate partner violence, evaluate the patient's safety and provide referral to appropriate resources. Substance abuse, alcohol, tobacco, and behavioral interventions to reduce tobacco, alcohol, and drug abuse. Infectious disease screening and immunizations. Yes, we need to screen for chlamydia. Screen all younger women, uh, almost less than 25 years, and women who are at risk of infection. Uh, STIs, gonorrhea, screen high-risk women, treat infected patients. Herpes. Simplex virus, counsel about the risk of vertical transmission, HIV, universal screening, syphilis, screen high-risk women, treat infected patients, tuberculosis, screen high-risk women, treat women with active and latent disease before pregnancy. Now, hepatitis B, 
vaccinate all high risk women before pregnancy, counsel chronic carriers about the prevention of the vertical transmission for influenza, of course, vaccinate all women. Measles, mumps, rubella, screen for immunity, vaccinate all non-immune non pregnant, non-immune women and pregnant. Counsel patients to avoid uh, in this three months after vaccination, tetanus, vaccinate with Tdap during the timing of 27 to 30 weeks where we are following, we all are following this norm. 27 to 36 weeks, we, these are the catch-up times when they come for the obstetric scan, uh, uh, almost uh, who have missed their TIFA, TIFA 20 weeks TIFA. So these are the uh, catch-up uh, uh, visits where we immunize for Tdap, varicella, screen for immunity, vaccinate all non-immune women who are not pregnant. So factors related to altered fertility in women and men. Females and males like weight loss, more than 10 to 15% of the normal weight, inadequate antioxidant status, inadequate body fat, excessive body fat, extreme levels of exercise, high alcohol intake, endocrine disorders, structural abnormalities of the reproductive tract, tracts, chromosome abnormalities and sperm and eggs, oxidative stress, severe psychological stress, infections, diabetes, cancer, other disorders, and some of the medications. This is common for both male and female related factors related to altered fertility. Females, recent oral contraceptive use within two months, anorexia, bulimia, vegan diets, age more than 35 years, metabolic syndrome, pelvic inflammatory disease, endometriosis, PCO, and poor iron stores. So these are the uh, women who are at risk now, males inadequate zinc status, heavy metal exposure, halogen, estrogen exposure, sperm defects, quality, excessive heat to testes, steroid abuse, and high intake of soy foods. Now, preconception care, women with chronic disease. Now, the different medical conditions associated with adverse pregnancy, hypertension, diabetes, blood disease, epilepsy, asthma, infectious disease, cardiovascular disease, cancer, kidney disease, autoimmune, thyroid, dis thyroid disorders, tuberculosis, mental health, and other. Now, women with thyroid disease, what are the second most common endocrine disease that affects a woman of a reproductive age? Over Thyroid disease is present in 1% of women of childbearing age. Now, how thyroid disease can affect your cycle? There might be different uh, cycle lengths. The periods are far apart. The periods in hyperthyroidism, the periods are much closer. There might be associated polycystic syndrome, uh, estrogen, progesterone imbalance, shortened luteal phase, and anovulatory cycles. That is how it affects your fertility. What are the normal changes in thyroid function associated with pregnancy? Hormonal changes happen like HCG, high circulating HCG in the first trimester may result in a slightly higher. Uh, this way the TSH return to normal throughout the duration of pregnancy. Now, estrogen coming from the placental origin increases the amount of thyroid hormone Binding proteins in the serum increases the total thyroid hormone levels. Size change, increase in the size during pregnancy, usually only 10 to 15% increase in the size. Now, interaction between the thyroid function, first 10 to 12 weeks of pregnancy, baby is completely dependent on mother for the production of thyroid hormones. By the end of first trimester, baby's thyroid begins to produce thyroid hormones of its own. So we need to continue to follow with the TSH values of 2.5, 3, 3, 4, uh, all throughout the antenatal period, first trimester, second trimester, and the third trimester. Now, women with hyperthyroidism occur in approximately 0.2% of all pregnancies, most common cause, 80 to 85% of Graves' disease, 1 in 1,500 pregnant patients. Transient hyperthyroidism, hyperemesis, gravidarum, maternal and fetal outcome is directly related to, to the control of 
hyperthyroidism. What are the risks to the baby? Now, if a mother is hyperthyroidism, having hypothyroidism, she's not, her uh, disorder is not controlled. So what are the risks to the baby? Uncontrolled maternal hypothyroidism will give rise to fetal tachycardia, small for gestational age, prematurity, still birth, preeclampsia, possibly congenital malformations, extremely high levels of TSH, TSI, cross the placenta, interact with baby's thyroid, cause the fetal and neonatal hyperthyroidism, antithyroid drug therapy, methimazole, cross the placental barrier, provide potentially impair the baby's thyroid function and cause fetal goiter. So here we need to understand this methimazole crosses the placental barrier. So here the, uh, uh, the mother needs uh, a change in the uh, drug as well as the dose of the uh, hyperthyroid treatment. What are the treatment options you have? Treatment of thyroid condition improves pregnancy outcomes. Over maternal hyperthyroidism should be treated with antithyroid medication. Now, thiouracil is the drug of choice. Now, methimazole has been associated with fetal developmental abnormalities. If a woman is currently on the methimazole, she should be converted to PTO prior to pregnancy. What are the treatment options? Radioactive iodine, customary to avoid pregnancy for the first six months after radioactive iodine treatment. Now, contraindicated to treat hyperthyroidism during pregnancy. So here uh, we have, if given after 12 weeks of gestational age crosses the placenta, increased risk of the fetal thyroid destruction, permanent hyperthyroidism. So the uh, newborn will have to be put on, uh, you know, uh, hyperthyroid treatment all throughout. So we have to be careful when we are putting them on radioactive iodine treatment. Women with hypothyroidism, that occurs approximately 2.5% of all the pregnancies. Subclinical hypothyroidism, that is equally important. We need to address this issue also. 2 to 5% of the pregnant women, most common causes are autoimmune disorder known as Hashimoto's thyroiditis, negative impact on the pregnancy outcome. Now with hypothyroidism, what are the risks? Mother, severe hypothyroidism, maternal anemia. Number one is the maternal anemia, myopathy, muscle pain, weakness, congenital heart disease, preeclampsia, placental abnormality, etc. Baby, if untreated maternal severe hypothyroidism can lead to impaired baby's brain development. Children born with congenital hypothyroidism can have severe cognitive neurological developmental abnormalities. How should be treated during pregnancy? So adequate replacement of thyroid hormone in the form of synthetic levothyroxine. Anticipate that thyroid medications will need to increase 30 to 50% through the course of the pregnancy, likely as early as six to eight weeks. Subclinical hypothyroidism poses an unclear risk for intellectual development. However, replacement therapy is recommended. So. Now, with the present antenatal care, we are uh, screening. We have made it as a universal screening. Now, initially, we had women at risk, but now we have made it as a universal screen for thyroid. All women targeted TSH testing in women at high risk for hypothyroidism. Now, at risk for hypothyroidism has been changed to a universal screening. TPO antibody positivity, obtain TSH treatment with levothyroxine for all with TSH more than 4 milli international units per liter and perhaps observation of those with TSH less than 2.5 and TSH dressing testing after conception. Hypothyroidism, increased levothyroxine dose by 25 to 30%. Hyper, adjust treatment to obtain new thyroid state change methimazole to uh, PTO or discontinue antithyroid medication in well-settled uh, uh, patient with the uh, euthyroid state. Consider ablative treatments in some patients. Preconception care, thyroid disease, universal thyroid laboratories tests are uh, 
uh, not recommended what it says, but we are doing uh, women seeking fertility. Women may benefit from screening, history of thyroid dysfunction in the past, including thyroid disorders, family history of thyroid disease, goiter, clinical signs of hyper, hypo, other autoimmune disorders. Now, background, you may have chronic hypertension. Approximately 2 to 12.6 percent of the women of childbearing age group do have this chronic hypertension. 10 to 15 percent of pregnancies in the U.S. are complicated by hypertension. Hypertensive disorders, that is, it could be a chronic hypertension, preeclampsia, gestational hypertension. The rates of pre-gestational hypertension complicating pregnancies uh, increasing from 12.3 per 1,000 deliveries in 1993 to 28.9 per 1,000 deliveries in 2002. So here, maybe these are all lifestyle-associated hypertension implications for the women if she concedes. Our goal is to maintain good blood pressure control on least medication. High risk for the development of preeclampsia, eclampsia, particularly in women with severe hypertension or vascular disease. Risk exists for progression of renal disease if woman already has uh, chronic renal insufficiency. Hypertension, what are the implications for pregnancy outcomes? Complications in pregnancy, spontaneous ab ab abortion, preeclampsia, fetal growth restriction, abrupt placenta, and Return births. It could be uh, spontaneous or because of the uh, preeclampsia, patient getting going into eclampsia, that could be a indicated preterm birth, iatrogenic. Now, hypertension medications, methyl dopa, most widely used. That was the uh, medication given. But now it has, we have few newer drugs. It has lifted. Uh, limited effectiveness, levetrolol, most widely used, may be associated with intrauterine growth restriction. Nifedipine, less well studied but appears safe. We have hydralazine, thiazide, ACE inhibitors has got teratogenic, teratogenic effect. Hypertension, family planning needs. What we need to know about is a uh, reproductive lifespan should be encouraged. So here, a life plan, a reproductive life plan that is uh, very important, and women should be taught. Yes, you get into get your BP under control, and then plan for pregnancy. Women couples need to be aware of potential for progression of the disease when choosing the optimal time to conceive. Estrogen containing contraceptives are not recommended on them because of the increased risk of the cardiovascular events. Progestin-only methods are probably safe. Women taking potentially teratogenic drugs, they need to be informed about it and the importance of using effective contraception. Looking at and beyond the disease, every woman with chronic disease should be aware of the potential effect of the disease and its treatment on herself. Her pregnancy and her offspring uh, showing to conceive as well as opportunities for maximizing the healthy, healthy outcome. All women of childbearing age group should be taking a multivitamin that include uh, B12 every day. All women couples should be encouraged to develop a reproductive life plan. So how important, uh, so this reproductive life plan is an important aspect of the preconception care. All women should be routinely assessed and counseled about the BMI, exercise, and alcohol use, exposures, and immunization status. Now, management of the pregestational hypertension in pregnancy. No evidence for mild hypertension. It does not give rise to uh, pregnancy complications, but you need to have a good control of hypertension. That is to have a healthy mother and a healthy baby. Yes, of course, the severe and complicated hypertension is more often associated with poor pregnancy outcomes. So preconception care for women with hypertension. What are the things to be discussed? 
work with women couple to prevent unintended or unplanned pregnancies, discuss consequences of delayed childbearing, engage both obstetrical provider and intern service or other providers for hypertension to coordinate preconception care for the women. Stabilize the woman on the simplest medication regime and avoid teratogenic medications. Hypertension, primary care versus the preconception care, shared elements, control of BP via lifestyle and diet modifications, goal to prevent cardiovascular complications, assess for the etiology of Crohn hypertension and for evidence of end organ disease. Now, this is a very important aspect. End organ disease like any renal dysfunction want to choose the least aggressive treatment that will achieve the desired control. Hypertension, what are the preconception care? Unique aspect, counsel on risk of preg poor pregnancy outcomes. We need to discuss about the pregnancy outcomes. If she continues to uh, uh, you know, uh, untreated hypertension, what impact it will have on the pregnancy is very important. If medications required, avoid ACE inhibitors, counsel for on the optimal time to conceive. That is what we were discussing about the required reproductive life plan. Counsel not to suddenly discontinue medication if conceives and encourage. So there has to be switchover of the medication if she conceives to conceives to uh, uh, non teratogenic options. Encourage early in entry into the prenatal care. Not clear that medical management of mild chronic hypertension impacts on the outcomes of the pregnancy. Now the bad obstetric history, WHO definition. Bad obstetric history. We need to know. Uh, the unfavorable fetal outcomes of two or more consecutive spontaneous abortion, history of intrauterine fetal death, growth restrictions, stillbirth, uh, early fetal deaths, or congenital anomalies. Now, bad obstetric history may be due to stillbirths, small weight baby, prolonged labor, intrauterine death, like recurrent pregnancy loss. Now, three or more. Now, the according to the FIGO classifications, we have two or more consecutive spontaneous pregnancy loss. We can't push women to get into the third pregnancy loss and then take it. Now, the norm is two or more consecutive pregnancy losses. Early pregnancy loss before 12 weeks, late pregnancy loss after 12 weeks, pulseless embryo, five millimeter or more in CRL, gestational sac, more than eight millimeter without a yolk sac, gestational sac, more than 16 millimeter without an embryo. Now, here we have the diagnostic evalu etiology, diagnostic evaluation and therapy. So the percentage wise, we have uh, see, gone through the frequency, genetic karyotype partners, genetic counseling, in case karyotype, products of conception, donor gametes, PGD, that is now became, now it has become the uh, important role uh, uh, for the, uh, that is um, for the healthy outcome, pregnancy outcome, almost two to 4% anatomic heterosalpingogram, hysteroscopy, sonar histography, transvaginal 3D ultrasound, septum resection, myomectomy, lysis of ad ad adhesions, endocrinologic, midluteal progesterone, TSH, prolactin, HbA1c, progesterone, levothyroxine, then bromocryptine, metformin, immunologic, lupus anticoagulants, you have aspirin, antiphospholipid antibodies, heparin and aspirin. Now, psychologic interview, support groups, hydrogenic, tobacco, alcohol, exposure to toxin, eliminate the consumption. So these are the different ways where we have uh, pointed out on these markers, uh, headings of genetic, anatomic, endocrinologic, immunologic, psychologic, hydrogenic. So it has to be addressed from all aspects. Now, periodontal, periodontal disease, impact of periodontal disease on women's health, heart disease, stroke, dementia, respiratory diseases, osteoporosis of the oral, oral cavity. Now, impact of periodontal disease associated with higher rates of uh, 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 poor pregnancy outcomes, 
So ACOG suggests that preconceptional treatment trials need to be addressed that also has impact on the preterm births. Now, long-term outcome of preconception care, that is the fetal origin of the adult disease, you have fetal origins of adult disease, fetal nutrition and endocrine status result in developmental adaptations that permanently change the structure, physiologic metabolism, thereby predisposing individuals to cardiovascular, metabolic and endocrine disease in a pregnant woman. Now, this is by the Barker's hypothesis, catch-up growth hypothesis. The traditional etiology of disease. Now you have the genome polymorphism that has impact. At the same time, the maternal diet, metabolism, endocrine status that has impact on the conception. After conception, birth happens and that's how the disease of the adult life. So postnatal, uh, we see about the postnatal diet, postnatal growth. So this all, has impact on the disease of adult life. Now, events in utero and pre-implantation. So the genetic factor is playing an important role. At the same time, maternal diet metabolism again has impact on the conception, pre-implantation period, post-implantation period and fetal growth. That is where the role of epigenetic regulation comes. Now, there are some genes already identified but the environment as well as the uh, the chemical or the uh, behavioral these factors play an important in uh, you know coming or impression expression of those genes so if the healthy habits are not followed these genes which were subtle they were uh, uh, like uh, in the hibernation they may start showing the expression. So post-implantation periods and fetal growth, giving birth, giving rise to birth, postnatal diet, postnatal growth, and predisposition to adult life. Now here you have the fetal adaptation, maternal health, and the placental health. Birth weight and adult disease. Now, why we are so much uh, emphasizing on the growth charts, uh, uh, like babies below third percentile, babies above 97th percentile, a new norm has come where we just don't discuss uh, about the gestational age. So we need to uh, tell percentile wise, that is 38th percentile or 47th percentile. So you need to um, tell, uh, uh, I mean to say, you need to tell the gestational age telling on the percentile. That is what the other day I was going through the uh, uh, about the uh, importance of growth charts. So below third percentile, above 97th percentile, how important for the IUGR babies. So we need to understand just telling 35 weeks, 28 weeks, that is not enough. We need to tell the percentile. Now, birth weight and adult disease, low birth weight, about 7 to 8% of all the live born infants causes are maternal factors, placental pathology, intrauterine infection, smoking, alcohol, severe, PGDM, etc. Now, low birth weight, they will have the high adult disease like ischemic heart disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, and metabolic syndrome. So, that is the impact of low birth weight. Now, every time, whenever uh, the mother used to come, she would say the child was born with so much weight, uh, it was so weak, and uh, the stay. So we need to ask what was the duration of stay in the NICU, what was the birth weight, and these things. So a lot is, uh, of the woman's uh, history tells us so much of the information that how her present uh, pregnancy outcome or when she plans for the next pregnancy, how the outcome will be. Now, birth weight and adult disease, coronary heart disease rates, these are more common, now different. See, 2.5, what it says is almost the in men, they, uh, the coronary heart disease death rates were very, very high in this group. 
uh, with low birth weight less than 2.5 kg. Now in women, it was little lesser than, uh, it has gone up to 110, whereas in women, it is somewhere 70, 780 uh, uh, of, if the women uh, has a birth weight. So she's more at risk of coronary heart disease death rates. So that was the study shown. Now, incidence of death from uh, cerebrovascular uh, deaths and uh, incidence of diabetes. Now, here the uh, cardiovascular disease uh, deaths from that was almost uh, showing to um, one, uh, 1.5. This, this is what the risk shown. And here the incidence of diabetes. So with uh, lesser birth weights, that was the impact. So diagram of the thrifty phenotype hypothesis. What it says is like the maternal stress, infection, undernutrition, placental dysfunction, smoking, alcohol, that gives rise to in utero programming. So maternal stress includes right from even the domestic violence, uh, not being fed properly. That is a nutritional um, uh, insult with the child will be having and uh, emotional. So in all aspects, we need to understand the maternal stress. It is just not doing a vigorous activity or anything. You have to take a holistic approach right from infection, undernutrition, placental dysfunction, smoking, alcohol. Now, this has impact on in utero programming, which gives rise to low birth weight changes in the growth metabolism and vasculatures. Now, reduce uh, smaller, the uh, lesser the low birth weights, reduced pancreatic beta cell mass, muscle, liver, adipose tissue, HPA, and neuroendocrine axis, kidney glomerular number. And then this is giving rise to uh, beta cell function, insulin resistance. Now here you have overnutrition, hypertension, renal disease, obesity, and leading to metabolic syndrome in the adults. So this cycle uh, goes on and starts manifesting in the adult as metabolic syndrome. Now birth weight and other disease macrosomia refer to Birth weight above 90th percentile cause maternal disease, diabetes, maternal overweight prior to or excessive weight gain during pregnancy, uh, prolonged pregnancy, polyhydramnia, etc. LGA infants who were not exposed to maternal diabetes or obesity were not at increased risk for metabolic syndrome. Now, newborns with SGA or LGA are at increased risk to develop a metabolic syndrome later in life. So here we go, the small for gestational age as well as large for gestational age. Both are at increased risk to develop a metabolic syndrome later in life. Metabolic syndrome, what is the definition? WHO definition is glucose intolerance, impaired fasting glucose, diabetes, or insulin resistance assessed by CLAMP studies plus at least two of the following criteria, like the uh, waste, to hip ratio, serum triglycerides, blood pressure, urinary albumin excretion rate more than 20 microunits per minute or albumin creatinine ratio more than 30 milligram per, per kg. Now, diabetes mellitus in pregnancy, offspring of diabetic mothers depend on, depends on the severity of the diabetes. You have good control, poor control and severe diabetes. So, in good control, normalize the fetal growth, poor control, get them into, uh, you know, poor control will give rise to macrosomia. Rather, you restrict the, reduce the uh, complications. Now, severe diabetes, if nephropathy, again, you have small for gestational age. The rate of overweight at childhood and adolescence is higher in the offspring of diabetic mothers compared to children of mother without GDM. So this we need to understand that they are also more at risk. Diabetes mellitus in pregnancy. Preterm, yes, of course, it could be uh, due to the age, gestational age. Yes, the weight may be 
3.5, 3, 3 kg to 3.5 kg. But yes, the gestational age is very important. So they land up into preterm births, macrosomia. Now, this gray shows about the GDM and the pre-diabetes mellitus. So incidence rate per 100 births, that is more in GDM and pre-DM. Now, long-term and short-term short outcomes now, hyperglycemia, fetal hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia, that in, bring, that in turn brings about the pancreatic changes, hypothalamic changes, DNA changes due to the oxidative stress and giving rise to metabolic syndrome in times of plenty. Now, here again, we have the growth retardation that again brings about the pancreatic changes. So this is how it again, in both ways, small for gestation as well as large for gestational age, they are uh, at risk of metabolic syndrome. Now, here you have inappropriate lung surfactant production. Then you have the increased metabolism, neonatal hypoglycemia, increased fetal growth, macrosomia, large placenta, then tissue hypoxemia, increased erythroblastosis, polycythemia, hyperbilirubinemia, and then in turn thrombosis, acidemia. So this, these are the short-term and the long-term outcomes. Preconception care recommendations are that ensure that metabolic control is at a optimum level to prevent congenital anomalies, check for and treat any proliferative retinopathy, assess kidney function, blood pressure control, cardiac evaluation, and neurological evaluation, stop smoking. Contraindications for uh, pregnancy, severe nephropathy, uncontrolled hypertension, unmanageable retinopathy, active coronary disease. Now, preconception care, dietary, Control, nutritional prescription should be personalized, taking into account personal habits, body weight, physical activity, etc. Now, BMI less than 19.8 per square meter is 35 to 40 kilocalories per body weight, whereas BMI 19.9 to 29 kg per square meter, 30 to 32 kilocalories per kg body weight, and BMI more than 29 coming to 25 to 25 kilocalories per kg body weight. Remember the folic acid supplementation and food rich in antioxidant. Exercise should be promoted, walking for at least 30 minutes per day. Assess the nutritional status. Now, when a woman comes, we need to really work on her eating habits and explain her what is her dietary requirement, what she's actually eating, what is her requirement. And these two things need to be compiled to make her understand, yes, that is what is the assessing the nutritional status. Patients should be screened regarding their diet, vitamin supplementation to confirm they are meeting the recommended daily allowances for calcium, iron, vitamin A, B12, B, and vitamin D and other nutrients. Patients should be encouraged to try to attain a body mass index, which is almost within the normal range before attempting for pregnancy. So that is a better option. You make the woman unconscious about it. Yes, your BMI and just take a little longer to measure the weight and check. Nowadays, we have got good BMI charts where we make her understand this is low BMI and normal and where she stands. And if you make efforts to get into this uh, normal range of the BMI, your pregnancy outcomes are much better, much, much better. So that's how this is what is all about the nutritional uh, assessment. Now, abnormal high or uh, very high BMI is associated with infertility, maternal uh, fetal pregnancy complications. That is what we need to put across. Now, nutrition-related disruptions in uh, fertility, undernutrition, weight loss, obesity, higher exercise levels, intake of specific foods and components, undernutrition and fertility. Chronic undernutrition, primary effects, birth of a small, frail infants, 
and uh, likelihood of death in the first year of life. So we need to improve on her BMI, acute undernutrition associated with a dramatic decline in fertility when food intake is good. So uh, we need to work on the acute undernutrition. Recently, I had a, a woman with uh, her BMI is uh, very, very low, rather below 15. Her weight was 33 kg. At the end of the pregnancy, she was 40 kg. She gave birth to a 1.8 kg baby. So we need to, fortunately, she was covered with all the, you know, her anemia correction, her uh, uh, steroids were given. And because of uh, all these corrections, the baby did not get into an ICU. But again, we need to re-emphasize the fact that how her uh, low BMI will him have impact on the pregnancy outcome. Now, nutrition-related side effects of the contraceptives. The oral contraceptives include blood levels of the high-density cholesterols, the good cholesterol, increased blood levels of tri triglycerides, low LDL cholesterol, increased risk of venous thromboembolism, decreased blood levels of B12, B6, increased blood levels of copper. Contraceptive injections like Dipoprovera give rise to weight gain, increased blood levels of LDL cholesterol and insulin, decreased blood levels of HDL, decreased bone density, contraceptive implants, they give rise to weight gain. So some of the nutrition related side effects of the contraceptives, we need to make them. That has to be a very informed consent. Now, other preconceptional nutritional concerns very early pregnancy nutrition exposures, folate status prior to conception, neural tube defects, recommended dietary intakes of preconceptional women, nutritional dis disruptions like nutritional exposures before and very early in pregnancy that disrupt fetal growth and development, the weight status, nutrient status, alcohol, diabetes, these are the uh, fields which we really need to make them understand some disruptions will have impact on the pregnancy outcome. Recommendations for the preconceptional women. Now, we have uh, 1800, 2000, 2000, 200, 2400. Here we have the grains, almost eight ounces, vegetables, three cups, fruits, two cups, milk, three cups and here you see the meat and bean beans that has the protein content has gone up by 6.5. So that is what the calorie need. Now maternal lifestyle interventions targeting preconception health, they are now the importance of early human embryonic and fetal life for late increased risk of metabolic disturbances, on the developmental uh, prior to pregnancy. So we need to make them understand that this has the potential. Now, where we go is the epigenetic modifications, DNA methylations, mRNA, histone modifications, gut microbiome, and inflammations. So this all will have impact if her... Uh, 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 this all has impact on the uh, fetal life. If the, these pre-epigenetic modifications, she is at potential underlying potential mechanisms going through her, inside her. Now, the maternal lifestyle during preconception and gestation, if she feeds herself, she puts on these refined and high calorie diet that will again have impact on the baby, inborn susceptibility to cardiometabolic disease. So postnatal, again, environmental factors like childhood obesity, early onset diabetes, cardiovascular risk, these are the, these are the outcomes for inborn susceptibility to the cardiometabolic disease. Now, pre-pregnancy, obesity and insulin resistance, the child is already obese. Now she turns out to be 
you know, she passed into her adolescence and gone into her reproductive life in a state of obesity. This is where we need to understand the genetic predisposition getting into the maternal lifestyle during preconception. So how the from the fetal life, it went into the neonatal outcome and then further the postnatal environment, which continued to be, uh, you know, uh, with uh, her obesity. And then she uh, continues to get into that, uh, her, the metabolic syndrome and all that. And she gives again birth, birth to a fetus who is at risk of the cardiometabolic disease. So maternal metabolic and offspring health, when things go wrong, Maternal overweight and obesity are associated with a substantial risk of gestational diabetes, number one. Then environmental and genetic contribute to the development of GDM with up to 14% of live births negatively impact, impacted by this factor. Both maternal obesity and GDM are independently connected with the pregnancy outcomes and their combination has a greater impact. GDN is independently associated with childhood IgT and exposure to hyperglycemia in utero is strongly related to childhood adiposity, including overweight obesity, increased skin fold thickness and body fat and greater waist circumference. Maternal metabolism and offspring health, why things go wrong? So fetal exposure to maternal GDN programs, future risk of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Thus, epigenetic modifications in fetal tissue play a mechanism of metabolic disease programming through the interaction of the environment, environment and the gene function. The two together, then the metabolic disorder surfaces out. Such epigenetic modifications can occur via DNA methylation, modification and alterations to non-coding. RNAs. Too little, too late. Why current lifestyle interventions are not working? So, in 2018, Lancet series on preconception maternal health focus, scientific and medical impact on the health and well being of mother at the time of conception, highlighting this foreshaping pregnancy outcomes and future maternal and child health. The government in the UK reacted swiftly to this message, producing resources awareness on preconception care. Such initiatives are to be really applauded. Now, first, what the limited scope of the preconception strategies, like how do we address? Now, initially, they realized, yes, the pregnancy uh, outcome and the neonatal outcome is dependent on the Pre-pregnancy health, pre-pregnant health, but how do we address it? That was a big question mark. So first was the limited scope of the preconception strategies with emphasis placed almost improving the food environment and with little or no mention of physical activity, exercise, major lifestyle interventions to en enhance whole body metabolic health. Second, the scale of initiatives was wide ranging, lacking specific prescriptions recommendations that many pregnant women seek. There is limited evidence that current dietary approaches have any clinically meaningful effect on the pregnancy outcome for either the mother or the infant among the women who are overweight, obese, or have already developed GDM. So initially, it was impacted on the nutrition. Later, they realized the activity. Activity also has a impact. So results from the majority of clinical trials show that dietary interventions are ineffective in preventing GDM. So now they came to a conclusion by contrast, the preconception adherence to healthy dietary associated with lower risk of GDM supporting the premise of health mo uh, dietary modification should commence before pregnancy. Now regarding the physical activity, European and American guidelines advocate that women should accumulate more than 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise, that is at least 30 minutes of the brisk walk on at least five days of the week during pregnancy to help 
combat gestational weight and prevent GDM. So however, 85% of the women, they follow this recommendation. Now, when RCT with the focus on exercise training in overweight women during pregnancy consistently report disappointing outcomes. Now, that was exercise impact of the exercise on maternal glycemic control, gestational weight, and the infant. So there are different pre-pregnancy cardiovascular fitness, poor adherence to exercise, prescriptions in most studies and campuses. So finally, they came to a conclusion two to three hours of weekly moderate intensity, less than 50% women, uh, less than 50% of women adhere to such protocols. So different studies showed now barriers to what they analyzed, why the women are not able to uh, take up any physical activity, barriers to physical activity during pregnancy include lack of time, having other child to look after, other children also, and lack of knowledge importantly being unclear as to what exercise, because many a times women, they are ready to take up exercise, but then they don't know what are the weight bearing exercises, uh, should they do it or not, what are the stretches. So being unclear on what type of exercise to undertake. Off note patterns of the pre-pregnancy physical activity is a determinant of, determinant of exercise habits during pregnancy. Now, here we again specific diet exercise strategies to implement sensitivity on our women who are pregnant and to be implemented uh, uh, towards the continued effort over the obesity, uh, towards obesity and to control the population. So here what we say, now this woman in utero uh, gestational age, if we take, they have the typical start of the maternal lifestyle intervention. This is the mean entry time, as we discussed, 11 weeks, and then around 20 weeks, they get into susceptibility to cardiometabolic disease. And then even if she's pregnant, at this, whenever she uh, uh, enters into the prenatal care, we should uh, encourage them to take up this uh, physical activity. Initiation of the preconception lifestyle intervention, that is a must. So you have the preconception health with the time restricted eating less than 10 hours per day and uh, making her conscious about the number of calories, intense interval training, initiation of the preconception lifestyle interventions. Then, uh, then comes your in utero environment. So typical start of the maternal lifestyle intervention. And that's when once this is controlled, the risk will reduce susceptibility to cardiometabolic disease. Now, a time to eat and time for exercise now. So we uh, really, when we uh, come to the metabolic syndrome, the diet has a very important role now. Time to exercise also to be commenced preconception, continue throughout pregnancy as able time restricted eating, daily eating window of less than 10 hours. Time of eating window less than time of the first to the last eating occasion. Now preconception, two or three weekly sessions of high intensity interval training. So what it says is, Minimum of 30 seconds, maximum four to five minutes separated by one to two minutes of low intensity. So now during pregnancy, you still have a two to three minute low intensity exercise spread over, even if it is done two or thrice weekly sessions. That is also helpful. A total exercise time of less than 60 minutes per week can still confer metabolic health benefits, providing exercises of sufficient intensity. So we should encourage women to take about the uh, medium intensity exercise. So encourage her to take at least 30 minutes of the walk spread over the day. And that's when here now the paradigm shift of a healthy mother has been changed to healthy woman. Then comes the healthy pregnancy and healthy family. That's what for the final wellness and health, what we uh, 
really uh, look into that is the preconceptional health. Thank you so much for the patient hearing. Thank you very much, ma'am, for the wonderful talk. Uh, it's always a honor and learning to hear you, ma'am. Uh, very beautifully explained the, uh, the need and uh, uh, what is preconceptional health. Thank you very much, ma'am. So if you allow me, then we'll take the questions from the audience. Sure, sure. We can. Yeah. Ma'am, we have a first question that is... Uh, how much sh uh, time should a patient wait after a bariatric surgery? See, what they say approximately uh, after the surgery, the patient is already into the convalescence. And uh, we, they, most of them get into malabsorption. So we need to address and the nutrition really has to be uh, properly managed and tell them the after the bariatric surgery uh, the person has to take very uh, frequently eat frequently and most of the time we have seen many of the malabsorptions happening because of that so we need to ensure that the malabsorption is corrected on an average what they say is about six months six months Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, we have one more question. That is, uh, uh, what is a nutritional supplement should be taken uh, uh, before planning a pregnancy, even in a men and women? See, in men, what they have said is about the uh, zinc and the micronutrients here. Why we need to supplement these micronutrients is at the mitochondrial level, we are working. And uh, for the men, zinc, of course, the coenzyme Q, which really has impact on the motility of the sperms. So these are the things for men, micronutrients to be taken. Yeah, thank you very much, ma'am. And of course, um, the, we need to tell them about the nutrition, uh, lifestyle changes, if alcohol consumption, tobacco, and uh, smoking, all these things also need to, we need to educate them on that. Yes, and also the weight gain, I mean the- Yeah, BMI of, again. Numbers. See what definitely goes for females also goes for men. Isn't yes. it? But but definitely B, BMI and all that for his healthier lifestyle, it may not have impact, immediate impact on the pregnancy or the conception aspect, because many a times it has so happened that uh, we have detected diabetes in men when they are going through the fertility workup. So we can't just uh, you know, treat the woman about the uh, fertility aspect and the conception part, but we do need to at least refer them, uh, educate them about the BMI, good uh, glycemic control, and refer them to the proper physician for further follow-up. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there are no more questions from the audience, ma'am. Uh, if there are any questions, definitely we'll post it on to you. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am, for once again for uh, giving you a valuable time and a wonderful talk. We'll look forward for your continuous support for these educational activities. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you for patient thank hearing. You. I once again thank the organizers for having given me this opportunity to talk on such an important uh, topic of preconception health so that let us join hands to uh, make women healthier so that we have healthy mothers and healthy babies. Thank you once again. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, many thanks from the SHIELD team and also I thank all the delegates who are participating in this webinar. Be safe. Have a good day.